And now, I mean, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, we do like to delve back into the Bengals archives, talk to ex-players, talk to legends. We've been very, very lucky in who we've had on in the podcast. Ken Anderson, Dave Lapham, you know, all those fantastic guys. Chris Collinsworth, you know, we can we can mention some more names. One of the guys that I always wanted to have on was, was of course, Ken Riley. Uh, but sadly, uh, Ken passed away in 2020. But we do have the next best thing. And I'm absolutely delighted and privileged to say that Ken's son, Ken Riley II, is joining us right now. Ken, are you there? I am here. Thanks, Paul. Um, I am, I'm here and thanks for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. It seems like a good moment to have you on, actually, because um, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Because we had the NFL honours on uh, this weekend. And inexplicably, and to, to all Bengals fans' horror and disappointment and anger, your dad was left out for some unknown, inexplicable reason, out of the in-memoriam bit. And, I, you know, I did, lots of other Bengals fans did. People went nuts at that. The, you know, we thought it was incredibly disrespectful to one of the game's greats, let's face it, not just a Bengals great, but you know the nfl one of the nfl's greats i'm not even a member of the family the riley family so i've got to ask you ken straight off the bat let's get into this straight off um how did you feel and how did your family feel uh well my my mom uh and sisters they really don't follow football like that and i actually wasn't watching it and then i just got on twitter and i i, I heard what happened so uh, I was very disappointed, um, very disappointed in the fact that uh, at the time of his retirement, he was number four all the time. Uh, he's number five all the, all the time now, uh, tied with Charles Woodson. And so for, for him to play for 15 years with one team and have those type of, have that type of accomplishment, not to be acknowledged, how can you have, uh, he's part of the NFL history. And how can you not uh, mention him was very, very, um, it was very disheartening. And it kind of just goes on par with where we are right now with the Hall of Fame. Uh, well, starting from the Pro Bowls to the Hall of Fame, um, the same, it's the same narrative where he's, uh, he always went about just doing his job and letting his actions speak for himself. And it seems like time after time, uh, he's, he's gonna notice for uh, being the type of player he was. And like I said, and uh, even some of my tweets, like uh, the man he was, uh, he was, you know, of course I'm biased, he was my father, but um, yeah, I can't say enough that type of uh, man he was. Like I said, he always uh, was a team first and uh, always well-prepared and just went about doing his job. And, yeah. and sometimes I think that to, you know, the detriment, it was, it's more like he got overlooked as well as a lot of other, unfortunately, a lot of other uh, Bengals yeah. uh, greats that haven't gotten the recognition that they so rightfully deserve because how can an organization be in, you know, round for over 50 years and have only one player? Uh, that's, that's unbelievable. Uh, it really is. And, and, you know, we'll get to the Hall of Fame in a minute, but again, back to this, this kind of strange omission from from the NFL honors uh, ceremony there, um, have the NFL have you have you sort of got in touch with the NFL or the NFL reached out to you to apologize? Is there anything going on there at all? They have not, and I and actually I know they were busy with the Super Bowl uh, this past Sunday, but I and I think the, the Bengals organization for their for their tweet, uh, but as far as the NFL have not heard anything, I. I don't really think I will, um, mm. but um, it's definitely unfortunate. Uh, but again, can't really, my dad always say, you know, control the things that you can control. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's how we just operate. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, but like I said, when sometimes it, things happen. So I don't know mm. what, what happened. Um, definitely should have never happened, but it yeah. happened. Well, I am going to make it my mission to try and get some sort of statement from the NFL because I do think it was disgraceful. Uh, you, you don't have to say that, but as a fan and a, 
of your dad as a fan of the Bengals, I'm, I was I was really angry about it. And um, so I will make it my mission to try and get some statement from them and I will pass it on to you. Um, it does lead on to the hall. I mean, I want to talk to you about your dad, what he was like, mm-hmm. because there's so many quotes from players and who just say he's the great, he was the greatest guy. You know, you look at, listen to Chris Collinsworth, who said he's the guy that taught me most about the game and how to play. And he right. just did it with such a unassuming, quiet, straight down the line, you know, friendly, warm, mentoring sort of spirit. But again, I need to talk about the Hall of Fame because um, that kind of beggars belief. And now, you know, the, the sadness of it is that your dad may well get into the Hall of Fame at some stage, but he's, it's, it's a tragedy to say that he's not going to be around to, to, to enjoy that. Um, do you, do you feel at this moment in time that it's like banging your head up against a brick wall? Do you what what needs to happen? What can you do? I guess again, I, I, you mentioned that amazing quote that you can only control the things that you can control. But still, I guess as the uh, loving son of an amazing guy and an amazing player, you you want to bang some doors down, right? Oh, definitely. That's my, that's my life goal right now. Uh, like I said, he was the one that was kind of bashful about it. And, you know, he never tweeted his own home. What I definitely can because, it, it, yeah. you know, that's my that's my mission now. And um, so, you know, if, if you follow me on Twitter, that's mainly that's all I tweet about. And I, I, <laughs> and I know sometimes you're like, man, hey, enough enough with it. But, you know, I just really think that, um, like I said, I played defensive back and I know how hard it is to get one interception, let alone 65. (laughs) And the last two years, you know, at 35 and 36 to lead the the conference in interceptions is remarkable. So Mm -hmm. he definitely um, deserves his right in uh, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And like I said, that's my mission. Um, Not Begging in because uh, he's like you know like I said he was he was prideful he had pride and he's like always let my uh my work speak for itself but mm. again he doesn't have to say I say it for him uh because like I said unfortunately he's not here I do believe at certain uh, at a certain point he will get in but it's unfortunately he's not here to uh share in that and um see it but uh no that's my my that's my mission to continue to fight to to get him um into the pro football hall of fame did he ever talk about it was i mean obviously it's a fantastic honor and a fantastic thing to have on as a life experience fantastic uh payback for all the years and the hard work that you put in so he must have he must have secretly deep down wanted it um but did he did he ever talk about it was it a thing that bothered him too much he, he only said that the only time that he would actually think about it was when uh, he would get, when when the time came around this time of the year, and he would get all the questions. He would get, you know, mm. everybody coming and asking, hey, what about the NFL? I mean, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And mm. then that's when he would start to think about it. Uh, but again, it's been, it happened pretty much his entire career, the same thing with the Pro Bowl. So he wasn't mm. surprised. But I know deep down inside that he know that he deserved to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mm. And uh, I know he wanted to be in there, whether or not. Uh, I mean, it's just like I said, he had pride, too. So I, I definitely yeah. know that he, he felt that he deserved to be in there. Uh, you must be uh, heartened by the uh, massive swelling of support. I mean, have you seen the love for your dad amongst us and the the whole Bengals on a social media community because I think your dad is spoken about pretty much every week. I see uh, someone mocking up a brilliant poster of your dad in action. I see, uh, you know, Captain Obvious talking about your dad. I see Big Jim Foster talking about your dad. You know, we talk about your dad. That must be amazing to see that love still there for him. And I can't thank you all enough. Like I said, Bingo Jim and, of course, yourself. And like I said, I definitely see it because, like I said, that's my mission. So it really does. uh, I really appreciate it. And I really try to make sure that I comment and, you know, retweet everyone that I see. Because, like I said, you don't have to do it. Like I said, he's been – he hasn't played – his last game was in 83. And so I really appreciate uh, 
all the fans, all the Bingo Nation, the Hude Nation, and, you know, just out there and all the support that they have uh, given him. Uh, so, no, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. And even though my, my mom's not on, I'm always telling her, hey, you know, it's uh, it really – makes us uh feel good and it's, it's just amazing because he was just my dad to me mm. but you know when i see uh the tweets and when i see like someone maybe you know wearing the 13 jersey or name their kid you know uh, <laughs> after my father it's like you know i i realized that he touched a lot of people and that you know he did it the right way and so that i have so much admiration and respect for him because he carried himself and did it the right way and very um, humble person, mm. uh, God fearing and uh, tried to live his uh, life the right way, which he did. And we're all are proud of him. Like I said, not as my father, but just as a man, mm. Um, mm. I just have so much uh, respect for him. And I think that um, that comes across as fans as well. You know what it's like when you follow the game, you're into players, not necessarily their whole personalities, but once they stop playing, you realize what kind of people they are and they're human beings. And mo thankfully most of the guys on the Bengals throughout my times of supporting them have been fantastic, fantastic guys, you know, and your dad was a, an example of that, but let, let's talk about your dad and his game. Um, what do you remember about his play? Because he was just before my time. Um, okay. I got into the Bengals sort of mid eighties. So just after your dad retired, I'd obviously okay. heard of him and, you know, let, we can bring up the stats, really. Um, he, as you say, he's number five in the in the all-time interceptions list in the NFL, right. only mm -hmm. behind Paul Krause and Emlyn Tunnell, who who were safeties back in in a very bygone era in the early right. 20th century. Yeah. Then you got R R Rod Woodson. Then you got Dick Knight, Train Lane. Mm-hmm. And then Ken and your dad at, was 65. And then Charles Woodson and Ed Reed and Ronnie Lott. So basically all of those top eight are in the Hall of Fame and your dad isn't. And I don't, I don't want to carry on about this because, but it mm -hmm. just illustrates it, doesn't it? What a, what a farce that, that, that is. Um, right. But tell us about, I mean, again, we're all about growing the fan community here in the UK. Mm -hmm. And there's some people that may have started supporting the team. I don't know last year five years ago right. 10 years ago 20 yeah. years ago so they wouldn't necessarily know what kind of player your dad was he was nicknamed the rattler first right. of all could you tell us why he was nicknamed the rattler well uh that was the mascot for the the college that he attended uh for a &M university rattlers mm. so um that was like i said that was the that was that's the um the mascot but so that's one part of it and then the way he used to tackle kind of like strike so uh that's the second part of it so it just it was a perfect nickname for him the rapper yeah. so so uh tell us what what was his style like you see these was he was he better you know as an as a sort of Darrell Reeves kind of island man corner press corner or was he better in zone what what was he a true outside cornerback? What what was his style there? What was he good at particularly? Well, he was, uh, they played a lot of man, uh, but he was more of uh, off coverage. Mm. Uh, he had he played with Lamar uh, Paris, who uh, was also a great uh, corner. And, you know, the Dion before Dion. And, uh, but he was a more off, but had great hands, uh, mm. very athletic. He was a quarterback all throughout college, never played defense until he was drafted in 1969 by the Bengals. So yeah. he was more of, he was more than my, uh, more of a scrambler, like a Russell Wilson. That's who he said. He, yeah. uh, he, he thought that his game was a uh, pattern um, more similar to, but uh, very, a technician, uh, very smart. He was a role scholar. So uh, he studied the game and uh, he, he taught me the, uh, the tools and the trades and a uh, very, very smart player and just consistent, you know, to do that for 15 years mm. uh, is uh, remarkable, uh, but never found himself out of place. You know, he kept the notebook of all of the receivers and their tendencies. So like oh, I said, really student, of, yeah, yeah, student of the game, um, always um, in place and, you know, a good athlete had good hands. So yeah. that's how he was able to get those interceptions.
And he was, he, he not only, you know, he was fifth in the all time NFL list of interceptions, but obviously mm-hmm. the Bengals record holder. That's right. unlikely to be broken for a, for quite a while, really. Right. Um, uh, also receiving yards as well. I mean, the, the records just keep on coming. Did, I mean, did he... The knock on on good players not getting in, or great players not getting into the hall is because they never made a Super Bowl. But of course, your dad did play in a Super Bowl. So right. you can take that out of the equation straight away. And again, it was coming to the end of his career. And I think Lamar had moved on by that stage, hadn't he? Right. Lamar Parrish. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it was him and Lewis Breeden, right? They were the, yeah. the tandem cornerbacks in that Super Bowl 16. Did he ever tell you any stories about Super Six, a Super Bowl 16? That must have been, uh, I mean, all the guys that I've spoken to about it just hate talking about it because they know that they should have yeah. won that game. Yeah. I was actually there. Like I said, I was old enough. That just goes to show how long he played because I was right. uh, 11. So I can remember vividly. I was at the game. It was so cold because I'm coming from Florida. Uh, that's where <laughs> I live. But uh, it was just unbelievable. Like I said, I was the biggest Bengals fan, knew all the players. And I just couldn't believe that we couldn't get in from the inch line with, you know, Pete Johnson and just like, you know, it was – it was devastating for me. Like I actually played the game, but, you know, just, you know, to get that close and, you know, just come, come up that short. And then again, uh, in 89. So it was just, it's just a heartbreak, you know, um, to, you know, he rarely would watch it. I don't think he ever really watched it, but, you know, they was, you know, they during the Super Bowl uh, times, they just showed pretty much one through whatever Super Bowl. So um, it's always tough tough to watch it's even tough for me to watch now yeah right Ken you must have some great stories about being in the locker room and being around players who were your favorite Bengals players at the time and who were the kind of crazy ones that you're because I think kids always gravitate to like the loudest craziest most fun guys right so yeah who, who were those guys on that team at that time um well uh, since my dad played defense uh, you know I uh, gravitated to the defense, but like I say, I, I mean, it was so many great guys from uh, Isaac Curtis. That's who he always said was the best wide receiver that he had to go against, and he went in, uh, he went against him every day in practice. Uh, Reggie Williams, <clears throat> who uh, they were uh, very close in our uh, roommates. Uh, he actually I actually worked for Reggie um, mm. down at Disney, and uh, we, we 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 became close and. Um, he, my dad always said he, Reggie was the wild one. You know, he was that uh, linebacker, right side linebacker. He was, he was the guy. He was that one that was just like, had a pain threshold uh, right. and was just like a madman. So yeah. if I had to to say one that really stood out a lot uh, would be Reggie. But, uh, you know, Lewis Breen, great guy. Uh, Ken Anderson, of course. Uh, like I said, I can go on and on with, pretty much the entire team because just a kid you know mm-hmm. you're, you're a fan of them all yeah uh so um it was Got just that. always but again you, you become thinking that everybody's dad's like that but yeah yeah no, definitely a great time 